so yeah, the title says it all, I hope, but we'll, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different things here kind of re related to um, the topic of postmortems. So, if you're not familiar with me, uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the kind introduction. My name is Jason Hand. I'm the DevOps evangelist for VictorOps, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jason Hand, um, so you know how that whole thing works. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the fact that uh, despite our intentions, even the best design systems are going to... So that was, a, that was a practice of empathy. Probably every one of you were like, ugh, because we've all been there. Things go wrong at the absolute worst time possible. And even though you know, some things are simple and there is, a, there is an easy fix, if there's one thing I learned from growing up in the 80s and 90s with technology, that some things, they just stop working. You really don't know why. You think you have a fix, and that seemed to fix it, but you don't really have an explanation as to whether or not that actually did anything. And while this still may work for our mom and dad, um, typically this isn't the type of world that we live in anymore. Our systems are a little bit different. Um, it is the future. It's actually almost past the future, right? We're almost into 2016 now, and even though we didn't get our hoverboards, we've got those stupid little booster boards or whatever they're called. Um, it is the future, things are different, and the systems we're building um, need a little bit different of a mindset. So, the fact is, shit will break. I asked Jennifer if it was okay if I said that. Uh, she said just keep it, uh, keep it chill, keep it low, but um, uh, we'll try to keep the poop emoji just to sort of speak our words here. Um, but the fact is that things will break. That's just how it goes, and of course, when things go wrong within our systems, it's kind of a big deal, and a lot of our teams are going to freak out because this is the way we feel when we're the one who's responsible for uh, dealing with these outages and dealing with this stuff when, uh, when our shit's on fire. And as intelligent beings, the first thing we do is to think, gosh, that really sucked. I didn't like that at all. I want to keep that from happening in the future. And so we, we set out on this mission to isolate some sort of root cause right, to make it sure that it doesn't happen again. And that, that root cause is the stuff that bothers me. I think root is actually a four-letter word within the DevOps community. And so we have these things we call postmortems. Now you can call them learning reviews, after action reports, retrospectives, honestly, what you call them isn't that important. Um, it's why we're doing them is what's important. But the problem has been is that as humans, we are sort of just wired naturally to go out and try to find that one single thing to fix, and that could be a person or that could be a thing. But our systems really don't work that way anymore. And unfortunately, the way we've been trained, whether you went to business school or you were in CS, is that we've been taught that you can follow a process and after asking, I don't know, maybe five of these types of questions, but a set number of questions, you can get to a root cause. And then you can get to a corrective action, and then you can get where Jason throws up in his mouth because he hears words he doesn't like. Our systems are actually different. Our systems are complicated. They are knowable in some cases. You can break them down. You can understand the bits and the bytes and the moving pieces and all the different stuff that goes into them. But there are still some known unknowns. And to illustrate that, um, one of the better sort of examples I'd always heard out there was uh, this idea of cars. And I thought I'd use a race car. That's actually me when I was 20 years old. I was racing stock cars in Indiana. This is a stock car. It's actually, it is a car. It's got a truck body on it, but it's, a, it's called a super truck. But this thing, I knew this thing inside and out. As a driver, I had to understand everything that was going on inside this vehicle. And with enough time and effort, I could understand everything. And so because of that, because of that I could control that. That's sort of an example of complicated. Then there's complex. This is where things that are actually unknown start to implement or start to inject into our systems. Um, and so we get into this area where there are actually unknown unknowns. And so to illustrate that, you take that super truck, that something, that thing that's complicated, and you start to throw it into a different environment where there's new things. There's things that you have to uh, pay attention to, but you can't really account for. So maybe like air speed, air temperature, track temperature, objects on the course, other people driving their complicated machines around, all of a sudden there's new things being introduced into the system that you really couldn't have predicted and you certainly can't control. 
And that starts to look a lot like how our systems are. They can be complicated and complex. And a lot of this has been described in what we know of as the Kinevin framework. John Willis brought this up in the State of the uh, DevOps address the other day. Uh, if you go and you do some search on this, you'll see a lot of good stuff. Snowden's uh, YouTube video helps explain it a lot. Uh, I have certain problems with some of the diagrams. I think the disorder area kind of looks like a Sarlacc pit, and the uh, little curly Q down there is kind of hard to understand until somebody explains it to you. Um, so I, I've done a little bit of a drawing at work to sort of describe this to somebody uh, one day. So I thought I'd go through, through that a little bit um, in a different detail. So obvious, um, the, the obvious part is what we kind of wish our systems were to a certain degree, but they really aren't. So in an obvious uh, system, relationships between cause and effect are easy to understand. They're known and they're familiar. And so we take action by sensing, categorizing, and then responding. And because of this, we can come up with a best practice. I'm going to get up onto a soapbox here for a second and talk about best practice. We kind of use that term a lot. What are the best practices for this? Well, the fact is best practices can only exist in obvious systems. They can't exist in some of our systems. And so we've been sort of um, using that term or that phrase incorrectly. And I don't know, maybe we can start um, encouraging others to uh, think about that moving forward. So that's obvious. Let's move on to complicated. Relationships between cause and effect require analysis, investigation, triaging, and maybe to some degree some expertise, domain, knowledge. When you're in this area, you actually look to sense, then analyze, and then respond. And because of this, we're not in a best practice mode anymore. We're actually in a good practice. Then we get into complex, where the relationship between cause and effect can actually only be perceived retroactively, in retrospect. This is where we get into why we do these postmortems. Because this is the only way that we can actually go in and probe, then sense, and then respond to what we should do. And here, this is where we actually take um, practices that are emergent practices. They're not best practices, certainly. They're not uh, even good practices. We're starting to come up with these emergent practices. And then, of course, we hope we never end up into the chaotic zone, but eventually you probably will. And when you get in here, the first thing you do, actually, is just take action. It doesn't matter what that action is. You just need to take action. And then we'll sense, and then we can respond. There is no relationship at all between the cause and effect. And this is a novel practice. So hopefully now we can all um, start talking about best practices comp um, and all the novel practices and all those good things. Um, so now, that's the science behind all this, right? This is why we understand there, there are no root causes. There can't be a root cause. There's a lot of different things, a lot of different factors that may be a contributing factor to what has gone on within some sort of a problem. Um, so, a little bit of a, kind of like, let's take a stroll back down memory lane. Do we remember when we didn't really want, as ops, we didn't really want our developers and our engineers going in there and monkeying around with our systems? Like, that just wasn't, wasn't what you did. And although we, in this community, have been really, really uh, pushing for tearing down walls, there are others who still like to build up those walls. We've moved into this fail fast type of mentality where we're going from no, no, no to go, go, go. We want to fail fast. We want to uh, push our systems. We want to make them scalable. We want to make them high availab uh, high, highly available. Um, and so we've sort of changed our mindset about how we look at this stuff. We're now leading uh, people down this idea of becoming more of a full stack engineer where you own the entire thing from the moment that you develop it and test it all the way out into production. That's your baby. You're going to be part of that. You're going to be responsible for that. A couple weeks ago out in New York, um, Pete Cheslock gave a really great talk. He's given it a number of times, but um, I saw him out there, and he, he made the statement that we know that the, the systems get a little bit better, or they become better, when the engineers actually support those systems. Um, and he's totally right. So. You know, this has been a, a, a topic of conversation within the DevOps community, is actually putting our engineers on call. And this is something that kind of makes them nervous. You know, like this isn't part of what they were trained to do. And, you know, it's um, something that is, it's just new to all of us, right? <laughs> but the ops teams, this is, this is new to them too. They're a little bit nervous about this as well. And the reason is, in our mind, 
the developers, the engineers, they've never been in this area. They've never had these responsibilities, and so we're not sure if we can really trust them with our toys. <laughs> because this is how we feel when they start playing around with our toys and they don't, and they don't handle it correctly. Gartner put out a report uh, not long ago that said 80% uh, of outages are going to be caused by people and processes. The other 20% uh, are due to weather and um, hardware malfunctions. Or mal uh, yeah, hardware malfunctions. I don't think anybody's all that surprised about that, honestly. Um, and of course, although humans may not be directly responsible for an outage, they are likely to be part of the resolution, part of like fixing what's going on. So no matter what, humans are going to be part of sort of this uh, ongoing uh, relationship of building and repairing and trying to keep things safe. So because of that, we have to start considering what it's like as a human to be part of these systems and the different things that do play a role and that we do have to keep in mind when we start doing these learning reviews or these postmortems. And bias is a big, is a big piece of that. Um, so there's a couple of biases, or several biases actually I want to go through that are, are sort of relevant to all of this. The first one is cognitive bias. So this is the idea of efficiency to thoroughness. You can either be highly efficient or highly thorough, but you can't be both at the same time. There's going to be a deviation in judgment because you have to sort of choose one over the other. Then you've got normalcy bias. I think this one happens to me all the time. I've never been in a bad car wreck, therefore I think I'm never going to be in a bad car wreck. Now, be honest, I used to race cars, so there's actually probably a good chance I won't because I'm pretty good at it. But there's, there's, this, there's nothing to really stand behind on that. Just because it's never happened to me doesn't mean it won't happen. But we fall into that bias. Our systems have never had a complete shutdown for you know, 24 hours. That doesn't mean that that's not going to happen. Then there's hindsight bias, where we think despite all of the evidence, we actually could have predicted this. We fall into this all the time as well. Confirmation bias, I'm probably doing this for my talk right now. I can find evidence to support just about anything I want to tell you. And what we're doing here really is just uh, creating these desire paths within our mind. And it's totally natural. There's nothing we can do to avoid that. All we can really do is just make sure we're paying attention to it and we're accounting for that when we start to talk about what happened. Uh, especially when we're talking about dealing with incidents, putting out these fires, there's a lot that goes on. You know, you, you get that page, you get that alert telling you something's gone wrong, but then you actually have to start taking action. You have to go in and say, okay, what's going on? Let's triage through this. Let's see if we can understand what's taking place, and then hopefully resolve that. And then we get to the documentation phase, which is where we get into the postmortems, and what are we going to do moving forward to actually try to make this suck a little bit less and improve our systems? As humans, we are wired to blame. That's just a known thing. Uh, there's a very well-known psychiatrist named uh, Brene Brown who states that blame is just a way to discharge pain and, and discomfort. That's just normal. There's nothing, we, we can't really prevent that. But like I said, what we need to do is actually make sure we're, that we're aware of that. And we take that into account when we start doing our, our postmortems. So when we get into these postmortems, it's more important actually to understand how something took place rather than who did what. We really don't care who did what. It's not important to the overall picture. And by focusing uh, or focus on removing that blame and then also keeping in mind all these different biases, we can actually start to identify areas of improvements for our systems. So the point of a postmortem uh, is actually to accurately give an account of what took place. Um, another soapbox moment for me is when I hear somebody saying accountability. So to be clear, accountability is just you being asked to give a clear account of what took place. That's all it is. Sometimes I think we use responsible and accountable in, you know, in, replace, of, uh, in replace of each other incorrectly. But accountable is simply just me giving you an accurate account of what took place. And that's what we want from our postmortems. We want someone, not someone, but everybody who was involved, all the different stakeholders who need to be a part of this, to be accountable for what's going on. We want to hear their story, what, did, what actually took place, so that we can learn and improve. Now, by show of hands, how many of you feel like you're a professional? Okay? Every single hand should be up. If you're being paid to do something, 
and I know that most of you are really, really good at what you do, you are a paid professional. Just like Peyton Manning here and all the other athletes. So why is it that we don't often think of it in this way? Because professionals, professional athletes, every single day they're in the gym. Every single day they're working out. Every single day they're working with coaches. Every single day they're doing something to make them and their team better. That's what a professional does. And we are professionals as well. Why don't we look at it that way? Why don't we approach our systems and the things that we do to improve our systems and our teams and ourselves the same way as a professional athlete does? Watching game tape. We, we listened to Katie yesterday talk about her football experience with how they go in and they just watch game tape. And yeah, you may have won the game and you may have killed it, but I guarantee that there's something you can find in there to improve upon. That's what a pro does. So when you get into these postmortems or whatever you want to call them, um, this is something that uh, a lot of teams are doing right before, before we even start, before anybody opens their mouth. You can put it up on a whiteboard. You can have somebody just come out and say it. But we are here for one thing and one thing only. And, or, well, we'll say two things, to learn and improve. OK? We just want to improve things here. We want to understand what took place so that we can improve our systems. So how do we do that? Okay, from the beginning, first of all, we want to establish a timeline. When did things start taking place? What was the first thing we noticed? What did our anomaly detection service find? And also, to be clear, you know, these postmortems, these retroactive or retrospectives, um, they don't have to be for something that went wrong. Okay, like I was talking about as being a pro, like it's good to actually talk about what took place when something went well as, uh, as well, because there's always something that we can improve on. Um, but we want to start at the beginning. So we establish a timeline, and when did things start to happen? And then we want to describe what took place. And this is really important. I say describe rather than explain. That's subtle. But when you describe things, you can just sort of stick to the facts. When you get into this mode of explaining what went on, you start to incorporate different bias. You start to allow different ideas of blame. And we want to avoid that. So although it's subtle, you do want to uh, describe what took place. And again, we go back to give an accurate account of actually what happened. Then you want to add as much context as possible. We talked about it in a couple open spaces yesterday that context is really, really important. You know, and it's really cheap to store this stuff. You can put logs out there. You can save all kinds of things into different databases and different data stores. Um, we want that stuff. You may not need it all the time. And you certainly don't want to sit there and stare at a dashboard all day long. That's not useful to anybody. But when something goes wrong, or even good, you want to be able to go back and retrieve this context so that you can have that and really understand what took place. The conversation and, and conversations and actions, those are also really, really important. You want to be able to go back and, and understand, understand what was said and maybe what kinds of actions people were doing. Whether that's, you know, if you're doing a, a sort of a chat ops approach where you're taking action from within a group chat or you're doing it in your uh, terminal, it doesn't matter. We want to capture all that and make sure that that's going to be part of that timeline and be part of that story as well. We really need to understand everything. Because there's a lot of different con contributing factors. If we go back to the Kinevin framework, we understand that there's going to be more than just one thing. This isn't a simple environment. So we want to understand what are all of those contributing factors so that we can, you know, just account for that. That includes everybody's sort of just general feeling. What were their stories? How did they feel? What were they going through as they were dealing with this? You know, and that could be something like, how long have you been on call? Have you been on call for like seven days in a row and you've had a lot of noisy alerts that are happening? Because that's going to affect your ability to not only um, acknowledge and respond to different things, but also what you do as you're starting to deal with these things. So we want to hear from everybody, all of the different stakeholders, what's going on within their own sort of internal um, experience. And then to we, when we know that, or once we've uh, sort of captured all that, then we can, move in, we can move on to what are we going to do from here to actually start making improvements. So we want to start looking for the smart kind of uh, framework here of specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and timely incremental improvements. And I've got small in there because that, that is kind of key. We're not looking for a big fix. We're not looking to boil the ocean. We just want to see if we can identify small, cheap fixes that, point, that sort of move the needle just a little bit further towards improvement. That's all we want. So now that you've done this, how do we know if any of this is even working, right? I've got, you've got this 
hippie boy up here from Boulder trying to tell you about blameless, how do we know if this stuff even works? You know, you can say, well, the Kinevin framework shows us that it works. Well, maybe, but there's other things that you can be doing, right? We want, we're, this is DevOps. We, we measure things and we, we go from there. Well, one thing that you can start, or a couple things that you can look at, is what are your mean time to acknowledge? What are your mean time to repair? And are those actually starting to get better over time? Because that's going to tell you whether or not these uh, these retrospectives and these learning reviews are actually helping you and helping your team and helping your systems actually improve. You'll start to see these numbers actually take a, drip, a, dot, um, a little uh, dip in d different places. How about actionable alerts? There's nothing worse than getting paged in the middle of the night on something that you can't do anything about. And that could be something that whether uh, it's actually not something I want to or need to do something about. I don't need to be paged because a queue is filling up at around midnight. That's because reports are running. Okay, no big deal. Why would you page me on that? Also, if I get paged in the middle of the night and I can't actually take action, I can't sudo into a box and do the things I need to do, that's a huge problem too. Why do you page me on this when I can't do anything? So we want to make sure we, we're keeping track of our noisy alerts and how is that going to impact us and what, do we, what can we do to improve. A couple weeks ago up in uh, the city, up in San Francisco, there was the DevOps Enterprise Summit, which was a great event. I highly encourage you to check that out next year. And J. Paul Reed and Kevin uh, Finn Braun uh, did a wonderful talk on, on this very same subject, a lot of the same stuff that I'm mentioning here. And they made a really good point, that it's not about the outcome, it's about the response. And they're totally right, because we aren't trying to find that one single thing to fix. We just want to know how to respond to this so that we can move forward and, again, make improvements. Just like Bob here, we're taking baby steps, small, small incremental improvements. Teeny tiny action figures or items. You guys remember muscles? Did anybody go down to the History Museum yesterday? Yeah, it's like walking through my childhood. It's kind of sad. And one other thing that's important is that this isn't something you just do and you're done. Ongoing, okay? So continuous, that's the whole point of this. That's what continuous means. We never stop. We're just con constantly moving forward, constantly uh, trying to find improvements. It's ongoing forever. We want to find different things that we can knock down. There's going to be silos and walls and whatever bottlenecks and friction that's just getting in our way. That's the whole point of this is that we, we find different ways to continuously find um, better methods and better solutions to deliver our software. And so sort of wrapping up here, um, something to take away is that none of this is ever, we're never finished with any of this. Okay, we're never finished with continuous improvement. We're never finished with transforming the software that we deliver and the methods that we deliver it and the way that we keep it safe and the way that we maintain it and keep it available. We're never finished with this stuff. It's all continuous. We're always climbing, always trying to get better and improve everything that we do and the way that we do it. So with that, it's been an honor. I appreciate you having me up here. I've really enjoyed this uh, event. This has been great. Last year's Silicon Valley DevOps Days was my very first DevOps Days. I've since been to about 16 of them. This is my 11th just this year. And I, uh, like Jennifer mentioned, I organized the one in Denver. Um, this is one of my favorite events, and you guys are very a uh, big part of why I love coming to these events. It's so, it's so awesome to be here amongst my peers, a lot of you know, really great brainy people, fun people. And um, if you'd like to talk more, I'll be hanging out over the Victor Ops table, or you can grab me in the hall, and uh, maybe we can do some open spaces later on some different topics related to this. So that's all I got. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>